You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Christina Patterson and the presenter and podcaster Johnny Gould. Welcome to both of you. Nice to so let's see what's on uh, some of those front pages for you now. And of course, marches through London feature on many of the front pages. The Observer says calls grow for Israel to hold ceasefire in Gaza as marches throng London. On the Express, dignity and dishonour as the nation remembers our war dead. Extremists from the left and right march for hate. The Mirror simply says, sack her now, reporting on calls for the Prime Minister to axe the Home Secretary after ugly scenes on Armistice Day. The Sunday Telegraph echoes Rishi Sunak's condemnation. Far-right thugs and Hamas sympathisers disrespect our heroes. The Sunday Times has a similar story with the headline, Hate, Intolerance and Arrests as Thugs Hijack Armistice Day. The Sun on Sunday only has one word headline, tomorrow, and that's despicable. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Christina Patterson and Johnny Gould. Welcome again. Let's start with the Sunday Express and their uh, bold front page headline, Dignity and Dishonour. Johnny. And they have summarised um, what is to come ahead tomorrow. Um, the idea that um, whatever's happened around this event, with it, we should remember our war dead. This is a sacred moment for the British people. This is a moment of unity. It should be. It's over a century old, the Cenotaph um, commemoration. This is a moment where the country should come together. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that in the last four weeks. Um, the problem lies, I believe, uh, in the 300,000 people who protested um, for the pro-Palestinian march. There were just a 1,000 um, on the um, counter-protest. And the amount of anti-Semitism that we've experienced is shocking. It is keeping Jewish people in their homes for fear of attack. Um, dropping kids at school every day is an act of extra vigilance. It's extremely unpleasant. Uh, we are seeing reports that a home with a Jewish mezuzah on the doorpost mm. was covered in red paint, spattered with blood. Uh, I went past Kilburn High Road today, which was in the area, and there was lots of tooting and celebration with Palestinian flags anywhere. It's not a place I want to uh, stay. Uh, and I think that, as I mentioned, 300,000 people um, in what is called a pro-Palestinian protest but might be referred to as an anti-Israel one, there are many other ways of supporting Arab Muslim ideas. OK, it's not just fixated on mm. the Palestinian issue. But, but just to say that the uh, far-right protesters, they, they've been described as the counter-protesters, it was amongst them that, that we saw someone attempt a, a Nazi salute that we've, we've caught on, on film. And equally, on the other side, calls for the destruction of Israel from the river to the sea, Kaibar, Kaibar, the... Uh, um, it was said in Arabic, um, the, the, the armies of Mohammed will come and get you again. Um, uh, placards which say, uh, you know, clean up uh, the world and chuck Israelis and Jews in the bin, all this kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's on both sides, but when I say that 300,000 are turning up and that number is increasing with every week, this is a fearful moment, not just for Jewish people, but I think for yeah. British people as well. Let's bring Christina in. Uh, it must be said that those aren't the, the views, the views that you express, that they are not the views of, of all 300,000 people Certainly that were, not. were marching. Certainly not. And I absolutely share your views about the anti-Semitism that has been rife since the attack on the 7th of October. And I know uh, personally many Jewish people who have just been filled with anxiety and horror since then. And I also know Muslim people who feel that they are now subject to Islamophobia in a way that they haven't been before. I have not particularly supported the marches before um, for all kinds of reasons. The, the, the main one being that Hamas doesn't want to see fire, ceasefire. I mean, we know Israel doesn't want to ceasefire and we know that Israel... Uh, 
is experiencing an existential threat from Hamas. But as Gillian said, the vast majority of people on that march today marched peacefully. The vast majority of arrests were on the counter-protests, the EDL, Tommy Robinson. Uh, it seems to me that if you want to talk about hate march, that was the biggest component of hate in this march. The reason that I would not march on a march like this is because I would not want to be walking with people who are carrying slogans saying from the river to the sea. I do know people, I, I know people who genuinely think that slogan is fine. It is not fine. It is essentially saying that Israel should be obliterated, the legal entity of Israel should be obliterated, and that clearly is not acceptable. But we are talking about an incredibly complex picture here. I absolutely... What is happening in Gaza is horrific. Biden himself has said that far too many Palestinians have died. Of course, any Palestinians dying is too much, but that is what happens in a war. I think that Israel will be under increasing pressure to stop the fighting or at least uh, rein it in, which is one of the reasons that it's going in so aggressively at the moment. But I also want to say that I just don't see this as a time for political point scoring. I am not on one side, I am not on the other side. I don't want anybody to die in war and I don't want to win any arguments on this. It is an absolute tragedy that we are observing and I don't want to talk about it with friends. I wouldn't talk about it here if I wasn't being asked on here because None of it makes any difference, but I think we just have to bring calm and balance to what is an absolutely horrific situation. No, I think you're absolutely right in the fact that there's no side of the, the argument to, to win. Let's look at the, the, the Sunday Times. Hate, intolerance and arrest as thugs hijack Armistice Day. I suppose the question to ask Johnny is, should marches be taking place on Armistice Day? Um, I deeply regret the decision to have marches, the police really need to keep our cenotaph safe. Uh, there is a war to be won uh, for Israel. Um, these aren't issues of point scoring. As Christina said, it's, it's a situation where Israel needs to go in hard and try to finish this job before the calls for ceasefire reach the White House. I think those are the people that, uh, most, uh, that, that Israel will most listen to, be forced to listen to. Uh, but, but, but do you think that, that it's people's right to call for a ceasefire? It is, um, but it won't make a, a jot of difference to Israel's policy. Indeed, if uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu Yahu was replaced tomorrow, I don't think any um, Israeli leader would change uh, the f um, method by which Israel was going in either. There is a unified um, desire to get the hostages back. There are 240, mostly civilians, hidden in tunnels in various different parts of Gaza. We don't know where they are. As, we, as Ron Dermer said on uh, Sky News just a few minutes ago, um, we don't know the numbers mm. of casualties. Uh, this is coming from the Gazan Health Ministry, which is a part of Hamas. It is not a free country uh, to say those things. And we certainly Netanyahu know. tonight saying that there will be no ceasefire. There will be no ceasefire. Without hostages, that. all the hostages are being returned. Let's move to the... Um, political element of of this and the the mirror calls again for Suella Braverman uh, to be sacked particularly yeah. because of what she had to say in the run-up to the protest I have to say if we're talking hate I think the prime candidate at the moment in this country is Suella Braverman I can't think of anyone who has done more to foster hate over it, it, during her tenure as Home Secretary but most particularly in the last week look I don't support of course I want there to be peace in the Middle East. In terms of an actual ceasefire, I take the same view as Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak for the moment, which is that us asking for a ceasefire does not mean that Hamas will give one, and if Hamas doesn't give one, Israel won't give one. So I, I, I see it as irrelevant politically except as a shriek of rage, and I absolutely understand the shriek of rage because it is heartbreaking and unbearable to watch what's happening in Gaza. But I think if anyone has fueled hate in this country it is Suella, Suella Braverman and it was totally wrong of her to call this a hate march people the vast majority of people on those marches 
however naive some of them might be politically and however ill-informed some of them might be political, they are not marching for hate, they are marching for peace. And she was the one, it was her provocation, and Sadiq Khan has said this today, that has uh, goaded the EDL to join in. The EDL are meant to be patriots. They are the ones who were uh, protesting and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and involved and uh, behaving in a way that provoked 80 arrests near the cenotaph. So absolutely, Suella Braverman should be sacked. Uh, Rishi Sunak is looking extremely weak and she is not worthy of the post of Home Secretary. Johnny, what's your, your view? Should she go now? I hope they resist calls for her resignation because I think she is articulating a silent majority of people who really feel that she is the only person who is talking up what is really going on out there. There have been four weeks of marches like this. And if people are naive, as they say, they hear what is being chanted. They hear about the talk of destruction of the State of Israel. They are seeing the placards. And if they are naive, it's time to wise up and really understand what they are marching for. So do you agree that they are hate marches then? Um, I, I think she has a point, And I think that many of the Tory front benches and even some of their back benches, many of the back benches on perhaps the right of the party, um, are, are hiding behind her 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 bravery, I think I think. Um, you know, she's the Home Secretary and um, you know, perhaps in that uh, state of office she should calm her words, but she is a conviction politician. That's who she is. That she's is not no, really... that is no excuse. If your home secretary, your job is to is to try to counter division. She has been absolutely fostering division and the vast majority of protests today were on from the counter-protesters, 80 protests from the counter-protesters, very few on the other side. So, Johnny, I just don't know how you can say but that she the majority has a point. of people are marching for Well, for I'm hate. afraid it's been four weeks of this. They know exactly what's going on. They know exactly what, what, what's going on. They know that uh, they are in danger if they are marching for peace. They know by now, or they should know by now, that there's an element of this which means they are supporting Hamas. They are supporting anti-Israel sentiment. Just very quickly before we go to the break, I just want to get your view on the Jewish people that are marching for pro-Palestinians. What, what's, what's your view on, on that? I have absolutely no idea why Jewish people would support a pro-Hamas rally. It's, well, not, a pro, it's no, not a pro-Hamas rally. Well, what they, no. they would it's say not is that pro -Hamas they're rally. promoting and supporting peace. And they're these, marching for these, the innocent uh, these Jewish people as have well said, as the innocent <laughs> These Jewish people. people have said the holiest morning prayer for Hamas fighters in the past. Uh, I'll make no apology in saying that uh, they are beyond the pale and that they do not represent a respectable mainstream Jewish view. Well, I have okay. to say that my Muslim friends who have been on those marches, there is no way that they support Hamas. And personally, I think it's deeply insulting to suggest you that have, they do. You have good Muslim friends, as I do as well, because uh, there is uh, a group of Muslim people in the world who don't put their entire uh, support behind this uh, extremist Palestinian narrative. And I'm talking about the Gulf Arabs who have normalised with Israel. I have made many, many friends in the Gulf, uh, for example, in the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, I'm going to make a, a, a television show about that to create the idea that peace can exist with the Gulf Arabs who refuse to be hijacked in their religion by this Palestinian cause. OK, we're, we're going to leave it, it there. Obviously, we can go on and uh, continue the discussion, but we're going to take a break now, so stay right where you are. Uh, coming up, uh, we're going to look at uh, more of the stories in tomorrow's papers, including this from The Express. Tearful King unveils tribute to Ma and Pa. More on that and other stories when we come back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, journalist and author Christina Patterson and presenter and podcaster Johnny Gould. Let us have a look at the Sunday Express now, pages six and seven, I believe. Uh, nation comes to a halt in memory of the fallen. Lest we forget, Christina. Yes, well, this will be um, the most poignant Remembrance Day for many years because...
there is war in Europe and there is war in the Middle East. And although we would love to think that war is a thing of the past that we commemorate on the 11th of November, sadly, that is not the case. And for all those who are currently mourning people who have been lost in Ukraine or in Gaza or in Israel, and let's not forget, by the way, that many of the people who were massacred by Hamas in Israel were peace activists, which is one of the things that made their massacre all the more poignant. Um, I, think, I, I think tomorrow's ceremony at Cenotaph will be almost unbearably moving, actually. I always find it very moving. But I think in the midst of everything that we're going through and, and you know, the, the, the figures that are reported of of deaths are heartbreaking enough. But what we also have to remember in both Israel and Gaza and in any war is the vast number of people who are wounded and, who's, and who have life-changing injuries. And to live with, you know, we see through Prince Harry's work um, with disabled veterans, and there will be many people tomorrow at the Cenotaph who have lost limbs, who's ha who have had their lives uh, completely changed by fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq. War of any kind blows lives apart. And I think it's really, really important that as a society, even if it's just for one day a year, we honour those who give their lives or the rest of their lives in which are changed radically for the service of their country, because it is something that they live with the consequences of that forever. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and thankfully, Johnny, the actual two-minute silence was observed oh, today. It was, it was impeccable. And, um, yes, I, I observed it with my uh, two children. They're not quite, they didn't quite know how not to be quiet, but they understood mm. uh, that, I, that I was quiet. Um, it is a moment of reflection. Um, the Israeli figures are that between 1,200 and 1,400 were killed on October the 7th, but 7,500 uh, were injured, and many of them will have life-changing injuries. Of course, there is uh, mental trauma as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you say, Christina, this is sacred tomorrow. This will be arguably the most moving cenotaph ceremony I can ever remember. And it's over a century old, and it reflects the armistice of the First World War, all the sacrifices of the 20th century that we went through, and more recent wars as well. And I really hope, I pray, that it is a moment of unity for as many British people as possible. And it's the first for the king. As mm. king, um, we read that uh, he'll unveil tribute to Ma and Pa. That's mm. also in the <laughs> Express. Uh, pages two and three, have we got that one? It's just uh, coming up. So the, the tearful, tearful king unveils tribute to Ma and Pa. Yes, well, um, I mean, he has, he has, it's only a year since his mother died, and I think in one sense everyone thought she would go on forever, and the last time I saw you, Gillian, in real life was outside Buckingham Palace doing the press preview after the Queen died, and that's not very long ago. Her service to the country was impeccable, and I think... King Charles loved his mother dearly, loved both his parents dearly, was very much aware that the, the ethos that carried them through their entire lives was one of public service, which is also the ethos that drives people who serve their country in, in the army. So I, I have no doubt that those tears were genuine and deeply felt. And, and I you know, would also like to say I think he is doing a really, really good job as a monarch. And um, it's a an impossible job, a very, very difficult job. But I think he's doing it with great dignity and with very strong Christina, feeling. We must leave it there. 